Welcome everyone, Quastine here with some more essential early game tips for Total War Warhammer 3. In the previous video I covered the campaign situation as for Grim, where early game aggressiveness really helps you out because you overcome some challenges that will arise later on in the campaign if you're playing passively during the course of a campaign. So aggressiveness does matter. But it's sometimes not going to be enough. Sometimes you have a campaign like Vlad has over here. He starts with Drachenhof, he starts with a minor settlement here, he's at war with Tempelhof. The problem in his campaign is that he's surrounded by the Empire and the Dwarves, and to the north he's got two major problems in both Azag and Trika. Over here I ended up in a war with Azag. Some poor decision making on my part, but I don't really care about this campaign. This is more a showcase about how to do certain things and avoid certain unpleasant situations. So let's talk about diplomacy. There are several things that matter when it comes to diplomacy. One of those is your strength rank. Your reliability, of course, also matters a significant amount, but just don't break agreements you've made with factions, don't backstab them, and your reliability will stay high. Your strength ranking is basically how strong you are, how many armies you have in particular, and how good those armies are compared to every other faction around the world. If you're high on the strength ranking, factions will generally leave you alone, even if they don't particularly like you. But it's obviously not the only thing. Suffice it to say, however, being weak means you're viewed as a target. Being strong means that people will try and not mess with you. There are, of course, other factors, aversion being one of them. And the problem in Vlad's campaign situation over here is that the dwarves, Ungram and Zufbar, have a minus 40 aversion against you as a vampire. This also applies to the empire. So how do you deal with a campaign situation like this? Well, with Ungrim, the way I decide to deal with that situation is I declared war on the Crooked Moon and asked him to pay me. So because of that, he did, or rather I declared war on the Bloody Spears, not uh, Crooked Moon. Uh, and because of that, he did appreciate me. My relations with him are still pretty bad, but he does appreciate what I've done against the Red Eye Goblins. So you gotta be aware of your version with regards to other factions. Another thing that does matter is that the AI does care about certain settlements and will want to take them. If you're neutral with the AI, hell, you might even be allied, they might declare war on you just to take those settlements. The AI will also attack you in undefended settlements if they feel they can get away with it. So over here, I was not at war with Averheim, but I did leave myself vulnerable because I moved my armies from the Mut, I took it from Sterland. Averheim uh, saw that because I moved my armies north to deal with the exact principal armies over here near uh, the settlement. Um, and Averheim marched uh, its forces here to the, uh, to the Mut to take it from me. That isn't a great situation. Of course, Averheim doesn't like the fact that I wiped out Zofpar because they have good relations with Zofpar. And now, the problem I created for myself in this situation is that not only am I at war with Averheim, I'm also at war with Scrag. And the person I've actually benefited the most over here is Scrag, whose army is actually going to march against Averheim in every campaign. So Scrag is right here. He's going to take the settlement. So it would be in my best interest to actually make a deal with Averheim over here and maybe sell them the, uh, the moot or maybe wait for, the, for Scrag to weaken them and they might agree uh, to a ceasefire. I certainly don't want to end up in a war with Gelt because I have already got enough issues on hand. And so sometimes, and this is a valuable lesson, sometimes expanding in certain directions is not necessarily the best idea. I decided to do so because I thought, oh, Sterling's an easy picking. But then I ended up in a war with Azag, then Averheim, so it kind of spiraled out of control over there. So you got to be careful with certain decisions you're making. Basically, you want to eliminate Zofbar over here in the campaign, but that's going to piss off Averheim, so you can expect them to declare war on you. But you're not really going to want to declare war on them. Now, I could have taken the moot and just sold it to Averheim over here very, very quickly. Uh, but it's probably best in some ways that this has happened because I'm going to be able to get the peace treaty with them. And they're not likely to break break that. In fact, they might not be in a position to even uh, be aggressive against me after I've wiped out their army. But at this point, I don't want to fa wage offensive action. But how do you deal with factions that do dislike you? Well, there are certainly some faction effects you can use to your advantage. Vlad, for instance, over here, does have a skill that gives him 
uh, 40 diplomatic relations to the empire. The empire has a minus 40 aversion with you, so that's going to neutralize it. There's also the Lamian over here, which at tier 2 gives you 30 diplomatic relations with the empire, Kislev, Cathay, and Bretonia. So that's one of the major ways you deal with the version you're going to face against the empire. In fact, if not for the fact that my victory condition requires me to take down Altdorf, I would not bother conquering the empire in this campaign. But the short campaign victory condition does require you to take Altdorf, so that's exactly what I am going to do in this campaign over here. But how did I deal with the situation with the dwarves? Well, I decided, you know what, I'm going to wipe out Zufpar, and this is a smart thing to do in any campaign as Vlad. And this applies to, obviously, other campaigns as well. I'm just using this as an example. I took down Tempelhof, with whom I started a war with. Then I marched my armies against Zufpar. I even beat Ungrim uh, to Grand Peak. Took uh, both Zufpar and Grand Peak and sold it all to Welcome Ungrim. And this to was enough throne. to give me a defensive alliance with him. This is the thing. The AI does like it when you're giving it territory. It likes it a lot. So in this case, because of the territory I've given... As well as because, as well as the fact that I've um, done quite done damage to the Red Eye Temple Half, etc., I've managed to establish a good relationship I with Ungrim. One of the things I could have done poorly in this campaign was subjugate Temple Half, because Ungrim does not like that at all in any way, slay shape, or form, because he hates yet. Temple Half. Well, he also hates you, by the way, for you, historic reasons. But, but still. Play. By eliminating Tempelhof, by taking uh, Grand Peak, which is the Red Eye capital, and by giving him all of Zufpar, I've made them a stalwart ally. And that's not the end of it, of course. I'm going to march my armies. Ideally, in this campaign, I would march my armies over here, north. In a most ideal scenario, Draka and Azek would have weakened each other. That didn't happen in this campaign, but in most campaigns, on Legendary, very hard. Depends on the difficulty you're playing on. Um, by legendary very hard, and the vast majority of times, Draka and Azag are going to end up at war with each other. And they'll annihilate each other. Draka will generally win that kind of engagement, but then you just hop on over there, take uh, the Griffinwood Sackett, get all the money there. That would have been the best case scenario. But because I decided to foolishly declare war on Azag, well, that's not going to happen. So sometimes you might see an opportunity, but it's not the best opportunity. The best thing that could have happened here is exactly what didn't happen. Draka and Azak weaken each other, I take Sterling, then I march my armies against Draka, and then deal with Azak, sell the territory of Ungram, also make good relations with Katrin in the process, maybe by giving her the Ostromar, because that would secure all of this flank. And that's the important bit, securing flanks. You can't defend a territory like this if you're at war with everyone around you. Well, you could, if you're, uh, if you're willing to be cautious to be defensive and to pick your battles in a smart and intelligent manner but you're going to expand more slowly if you do so which also gives the AI more advantages of course if you want to play this is a total war campaign you can certainly do so but you're going to have to be very very careful in the course of such a campaign and you're going to fight a lot of difficult battles as well so over here i would take out the astromark uh, take out uh, this province and maybe give some of it to ungrim some of it uh, to Catrin, make deals with both of them, take, uh, and then take the rest of the empire over here and start expanding in this direction. To a certain degree, I only need to take down Altdorf, I don't need to actually eliminate Karl Franz, by the way, to achieve my short campaign victory condition. Can be complicated when you have a situation like this, the empire is a complicated campaign situation for anyone that starts in it. Uh, can be, of course, complicated, but is um, is something you can manage if you're just careful with your diplomatic choices at the end of the day. So selling territory to a faction that you don't need so they can anchor your flank over here can be great. And by the way, fun fact, because I, um, I was already a defensive ally when Averheim declared war on me, Ungrim also is at war with Averheim. So I'm actually going to benefit diplomatically if I just annihilate Averheim here. Though I don't want to take the province for myself because that just puts me within striking distance of Gelt and I'm not sure I want to fight Gelt here. Because if I fight Gelt, then, I put, then that will reveal Belagar to me. So that's the thing. When you're expanding, you don't want to engage every faction. You want to be careful about your expansion because if I encounter Belagar, that is a complication I don't need in my life. I don't need a war with Belagar. It gains me nothing during the course of this campaign. 
I want to head west to potentially save Kamler, maybe even the Red Duke if I'm quick, quick enough from Bretonia, but I don't want to end up fighting every single person along the way when it comes down to it. So those are some of the things to bear in mind when it comes to a campaign like this. I also gained a lot of money because cafe and caravans come through uh, Drakenhof, maybe even to Drakenhof. And when I saw a caravan, two caravans actually, I just recruited the Lord over here, moved them in the castle. Since the caravan was very close to the castle, I could just then do this, like just move out, strike it, take it out. And I took two caravans at the same time with that. One was closer to the castle than the other, but I declared war on both the, the factions. And I took the caravans out using the very powerful garrison of Drakenhof. This is something you can do in quite a lot of campaigns. But yeah, when you're surrounded by enemies like this, you should make deals with some of them. The What's the level of aversion, though, I that becomes too to much to bear? Zanganus. 40 is manageable. Well, you can actually have first. strong military allies that last you an entire campaign at minus 40. 100 is where it becomes the real problem. If you have a minus 100 aversion, and some factions do, then you're not going to be able to maintain diplomatic deals. You can do it temporarily, but it won't last you throughout the course of your campaign. So, obviously, that can be a fairly substantial issue. Hell, in this campaign, I might ally Drakai, but I do dislike allying with elves. They're not great allies uh, when it comes down to it. By speaking about allies, the kind of factions you want to make as allies are not the minor insignificant factions, but they're the legendary lord factions. The reason behind that is because the legendary lord factions get significantly uh, higher benefits to their economy than the minor factions. So Ungram certainly over here is not generating a lot of money yet. At least not from his capital, but from his minor settlement. But he's this is just still uh, early game. He's only managed to take these provinces very recently. Uh, he's still going to have to invest money. Hell, he might even be bankrupt because he does have two full stacks over here. Um, or one full stack, another one that's got 15 units. So he might not actually have a lot of money to work with, especially because Greetings. I squeezed him dry for, uh, for the territory he offered me. Uh, for the territory I offered him. So that's uh, that's one of the problems he's currently facing in the campaign. you got to be careful, by the way, when it comes to that. You obviously want the money from the AI, but... You don't want to weaken them in such a way. You might just give them the territory for free. That will give you increased diplomatic relations. Also, you don't want to give an entire province to the AI once. You might want to stagger this over a couple of turns if you Greetings. can. Sometimes you won't be able you to because request, it takes Dalia, time now. for your diplomatic relationships with the faction to grow. So, for instance, over here, I'm at 42, but my potential is going to go all the way to 140, maybe even higher. So, if I had waited longer... Um, when it came to just selling some of this territory to Ungrim, I might have gotten a better deal out of it. But I did want to get that defensive alliance with him very, very quickly over there. So Ungrim is going to guard my entire southern and eastern flank over here, which allows me to expand to the west. Which, And if I solve the issues to the north, I can then sell that territory, keep the Ostermark, make some kind of deal with Katrin, and... Um, sell uh, sell Azak's core territory to Ungrim, and he will help protect the north as well. That's how you get ahead in a campaign like this, where you're surrounded by enemies. Some people can struggle in this campaign. I certainly have struggled in this campaign at certain points because you're just surrounded by enemies. But that's the key to getting ahead. Diplomatic deals with major factions, understanding what kind of level of aversion you can overcome. And also, crucially, trying to limit how many battles you auto resolve. The Vampire Cons, for instance, as do many other factions, don't have a great auto resolve situation. Vast majority of factions don't have great auto resolve results on high difficulties or any difficulty in general. You're going to take very high damage. So what you may end up having to do in some of these campaigns, especially early on, is fighting these battles manually in order to minimize your casualties. Because if you take a lot of casualties, if you lose units, but if you take a lot of casualties, your strength ranking is going to be affected. Your strength ranking is important because if you end up at war with everyone around you, that is going to make things harder. And if a lot of faction, if quite a few factions declare war at uh, war against you, then many, many others may follow suit because they might think, oh, this guy is not gonna stand the chance. So if you take casualties, if you end up, it will, it will cause you to end up in Wars you don't need, and because of those wars, other wars may follow. Because factions are being like, oh, this guy's fighting a lot of people, let me jump in. That's how the AI thinks, that's how the AI behaves on the campaign map. It will 
try and strike at your vulnerable spots. It does so in a fairly stupid fashion, because Averheim marching its forces over here to the moot when Vlad, uh, when this army alone was capable of dealing with them, was a really stupid um, move. I could have forced marched Vlad over there to be closer to the Averheim armies, but or the Averheim force, but but I didn't even need to do that. So that. Those are some of the things uh, to bear in mind. Yeah, it does make some very questionable uh, decisions, but it does so based on aversion, based on your strength ranking, um, based on what the territory they done. want. Abomination. Like, for instance, Averheim also wants the moot. So that's one of the reasons they attacked it, because they actually want that territory for themselves, as does Sterlet. So just bear, bear in mind those kind of things. The reason Draika and Azak may end up in a war against each other in a lot of campaigns is both of them want the Ostromark for their campaigns. Draika wants it for the growth for her Gryphonwood. Azak wants it. I think it's part of his victory conditions. But he does want it either way. They're primed to do so. So there are certain behaviors that you're going to see from the AI in a lot of campaigns. Not necessarily all of them. Not here yet, but I kind of screwed that one myself. Because I'm sure if I w had waited a couple more turns, Azak would have ended up, ended up in a war with Draika because he controls Essen. So that's what it comes down to. Cosinier signing out. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and enable notifications, and stay tuned for more.